Oh. I forgot we were doing this. Well, this is a much, much, much appreciated and waited for video. If you follow me on TikTok, you know that I love The Secret History by Donna Tart. And if you follow me on TikTok, which you should, you know just how much everyone was like, please, can you give us a video on the back and all? And I gotta serve. So why don't we start by the iconic first line that I simply could not go without. The snow in the mountains was melting and Bunny had been dead for several weeks before we came to understand the gravity of our situation. I mean, that's how you start a book. Am I right or am I not right? As you can see, I have this book annotated to a fault. I mean, I was finding every single lie that Richard tells us I was just going in for the history and the literature quotes then the character arcs every single time I mean the relationships in, in this book are just so convoluted that I had my good friend Lee draw up a little graphic which we'll get to later but back and alls the secret history and real history. That's what we're going to talk about today. This video, I hope, is good and meets everyone's expectations of it. I'm very nervous to film it, but this will be my Magnus album if it turns out the way I want it to be. It's going to be unhinged. It's going to be a deep dive. And trust me, I have lost a lot of hours looking at this book and at the back and all the fictional one and the real one and the ways in which Henry, our sweet little boy that does not know about the moon landing because he's so in his own world of literature and the Greeks and the Romans. My dog is barking up a storm right now and this mic picks up everything. I'm very sorry about that. Anyways, Henry does not know everything as Richard makes it believe so. Hmm. Shall we, shall we begin? I have my computer here, which you'll forgive me for, but I have a 20 page script for this particular video. And um, uh, my memory at 23 years old, I am 23, yes is not the best so you will forgive me but i will look sometimes into my computer as we dive into this unhinged deep dive into the back and all of the secret history and real history so let's begin with dissecting the secret history all right i'll give you a brief synopsis of the whole book spoilers ahead of course so if you haven't read this magnificent book you should read it and then come back to it Come back to this video and talk about it with me but a brief synopsis then we'll do some characters synopsis i guess it's the word or arcs um, then we'll dive into the graphic my lovely friend lee made which i have on my whiteboard and it's amazing and we'll go into julian and bunny a little bit i'm just giving you like the summary as if this was my my article being published on an academic paper or something but we we i'm gonna give you all of that and then we'll go into their attempts at a back canal what actually was their back canal then real history the similar similarities between the secret history and real history and the conclusion so it's going to be a long video bear with me i I'm good company and the sacred history is good company 
And real history is the best company as always. I'll be giving you a Spark Notes version of this book because my god it's a long book with very long chapters and my mind, my memory is not where it was. In 1983, Richard Pappen transfers from a college in his hometown, Plano, California, to a college in Vermont, Hampton College, after a little bit of a strange ordeal in the college and acclimating to the space since he's a Californian dude, he's not used to such cold weather, um, he kind of gets obsessed with a group of mysterious students, and there's five of them. And after getting obsessed and having some experience in the Greek language, not the ancient Greek, he gets into a class, a very exclusive class, with Professor Julian Morrow and these five other students. Henry, Camilla, Charles, Francis, and Bunny. I don't, I'm not forgetting anyone. No. The other students are extremely wealthy at first glance, and Richard attempts to hide his much, much, much lower background from them because, of course, someone in the 80s, which, by the way, I thought this was in the 70s, this, I don't know, I, I was shocked to find out this was in the 80s. Richard feels like an outsider. I mean, he's poor amongst the rich. He's a student of Greek in a class of ancient Greek and Latin people that are very proficient at both languages. I mean, the iconic Francis going and him going what and he's like nothing because he doesn't know latin and at times henry and the gang will dive into latin so <laughs> richard doesn't understand what they're talking about but he makes an impression on bunny and bunny is the first one to really take in richard into the group once Richard starts getting invited to spend weekends at Francis' country house, he begins to feel more a part of the group as the months pass by. Over winter break, Richard remains at Hampton, continuing to work for a psychology professor to earn money, again, wealth and status. This book has a lot of messages concerning class struggle and hierarchies, which we'll talk about later on. He lives for free in a warehouse with a hippie. Again, this is why I thought it was in the 70s. <laughs> um, and he has no heat. He barely eats. The dude is on the verge of death at this point. Richard suffers from a cold and exhaustion until he's found by Henry, who has returned from his trip from Rome quite early. And that's strange, that's very, very strange because he went to Italy with Bunny and he's returning earlier than what was agreed upon. And Bunny talked up the storm about this trip. He was so excited to, to be going to Italy with Henry. And now we'll talk about the hierarchies of money once we go into the whiteboard and the character arcs because my god, it is so clear, so clear. After Richard moves back into his dorm, he recuperates. He returns to Henry's apartment to look for a textbook. There, he finds that Henry has booked four tickets from Boston to Argentina. And that's very odd because it was sudden and it, it was only one way. So where are they going? He knows where they're going, but why are they why are they going to Argentina? Why is it only four tickets? And why is he being left behind? Richard is not very keen on being left out and he is left out on the majority of things in the secret history. Richard is very anxious to see them go. He I mean he's obsessed with Camilla, so he's really just not happy that she's gonna leave him and never see her again so when class comes and they're all there he's like oh thank god 
he didn't, they did not go to Argentina. But Henry, being the smartish guy that he is, confided in Richard that they planned to leave the country for nefarious reasons. But he says, well, I didn't have enough money to go to Argentina and spend my life there, you know, so that's why we didn't end up going. Um, Henry tells Richard how they had a back and all. That's the point of this video at Francis Country's house. Um, that's. <laughs> Did they have a back and all? We'll see. The four of them, the four that were supposed to go into Argentina, say they achieved the back and all, that they saw Dionysus, that they completed the ritual, but it ended on the death of a farmer near Francis' country house. Though Bunny did not participate in this bacchanal, he participated in the trials of the bacchanal, he finds out about the death of the farmer and he starts connecting the dots because Bunny, prior to Henry's depiction of him and Richard's depiction of him because he idolizes Henry so much, so their depictions are very similar. Bunny is quite a smart dude. So he puts two and two together and realizes that it was the gang that killed the farmer. So he starts just blabbering about it, trying to make them feel as uncomfortable as possible. Though in his nature, he was doing more so not because it was a crime, but because he did not participate in it. He was left out just as Richard was. And Bunny did not like that at all. I mean, in the end, he does go into a state of, this is wrong, they killed someone. I mean, they're criminals, they have no morals. Um, but like, what did you expect from a bunch of 20 year olds that glorify and are isolated from the world? Yeah, Bunny is the only one that is not isolated from the world. Richard wasn't isolated from the world, he then becomes isolated and then when Henry starts to distance himself a little bit from Richard, Richard once again enters the world. So Richard is like in and out of the sphere of isolation that the gang is, but it's all very very weird. And then we get the major catalyst which is the death of Bunny Corcoran, <laughs> the <laughs> which one of the reasons being, oh, he was just annoying us. <laughs> he was just annoying us, and I mean, he didn't participate in the back and all because he had a grilled cheese and a milkshake, which yummy. Uh, but the reason for killing him was because he. <laughs> I'm sorry for like not getting it out, but the reason for him not participating in the back and all was because he ate something in the cafeteria. The reason they killed him was because he ate a little bit of ice cream from Henry's fridge and just put it back instead of taking it out and put it on a little bowl and eating it out of a bowl. No, he ate from the container and Henry was just pissed at that because Henry just does not live in the same world that we do. So he thought, okay, I murdered someone, so what's two? Henry toys with the idea of poisoning and this is when I cannot defend Henry anymore because he poisons um, animals, dogs, which made me so mad, so mad. Like, don't, he's irredeemable. Like, 50% of the book, I'm like, Henry Winter, the man that you are, you're stupid, but I love you. And then he just becomes unhinged because he thinks he saw Dionysus. My God. So he's always with the, the idea of poisoning, but 
eventually decides that pushing Bunny over a ravine would be much more poetic and much more brutal and efficient. He just can't deal with Bunny anymore, so pushing him off would be top, top tier. Richard is not supposed to join them, although on the day of the planned attack, Richard finds a note from Bunny in the library stating that he has gone to a party. This note has caused a little bit of commotion on the people that discuss secret history. I won't talk about it here, but basically people wonder if this note was... Am I wondering or did I read my memory? Like I said, not okay. However, Bunny does arrive into the ravine. Richard goes to the ravine to tell them that, oh, Bunny's not coming, he went to a party. So they're like, oh, we can't kill a person today. Oh, what would we do now? And then Bunny does come and they do kill him. And it's so sad, actually. His death is really sad because he's like, oh, hey guys, what are you doing here? And then they just kill him with... He's... Listen, Bunny's not normal dude like a, a good dude but he, he didn't deserve to die much less at the hands of his friends i mean what the hell snow begins to fall after bunnies that like the iconic opening so his body is not found for several days and the group is very like oh we got away with it we gotta get away with another one and during that time, the FBI, my god, he, like, the Corcorans pulled all the stops. The FBI got involved because they thought there was some kind of drug thingy or satanic thingy happening at this time because everything in the 70s and 80s apparently is satanic. Um, so the FBI showed up and they started questioning the group about it. And the group, especially Francis, Charles and Henry, but especially Charles, now that I think about it. Charles is white, white, like mm, repressed with it. He tries as much as he can to steer them into the direction of Cloak Rayburn, which was a friend and drug dealer of Bunny, which is like, you killed someone and then you want to frame the murder on someone else, like what? not good people not good people we're not dealing with good people okay from richard's perspective by the way this could all be just a fabrication on his mind i don't know after the snow melts however bunny's body is found and his classmates go to his family's house to grieve him have a funeral you know all the things you do for a funeral and it was very odd everyone was just weird richard was weird they were all doing drugs i just <sighs> when they return to campus they do not spend as much time together as they did before i mean killing two people inevitably 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 oh my god this word inevitably will separate a gang of friends i guess especially when one of the core people of the group is killed by the group itself so yeah i i understand how they are separated a little bit especially when the police was on their trails charles begins drinking heavily and he ends up in the hospital francis has panic attacks he tries to off himself quite a bit and it's quite sad um richard begins to realize that his friends such as the fact that charles and camilla have an incestuous relationship which we'll get on and that camilla and henry have been manipulating richard all along mm, okay richard begins to realize that his friends or supposed friends are not all that seemed to him in the first place. I mean, Francis has a lot of panic attacks and tries to, you know, step into another world, which Richard is an a-hole about, by the way. I, I have to breathe in very deeply whenever I think about how Richard treats Francis' panic attacks. 
like yeah Francis killed two people I understand like there's not a lot of morality in that but the way he treats his friend his closest friend in the group as having mental problems is like ugh, so annoying like okay uh, then Henry and Camilla also have a relationship going on like throughout this whole time that Richard was privy to because Richard is obsessed with Camilla so he only saw the image of Camilla and not what was happening right in front of him and he thinks that they've been manipulating him this whole time especially Henry which I mean sort of and Charles and Camilla of course have an incestuous relationship which we'll get on once we get to the whiteboard. Richard and Francis take Charles to the country house as Charles is increasingly paranoid about what Henry will, will do to him because there's not two without a third and honestly <laughs> Charles was quite right to think that Henry was going to kill him next because I mean you're both doing the same person um, Charles is quite abusive to his sister and they hate each other with a passion so I would be scared for my life as well if I was Charles I would be I would be so Charles disappears when Henry calls to the country house and Richard and Francis go to the hotel where Camilla has been staying to look for Charles there they find Camilla and Henry who had begun a romantic relationship or had been having one previously we don't know because again this is from Richard's perspective and he of course wants to think of Camilla as a pure innocent girl Charles arrives with a gun because he's a southern boy and he's just a cowboy and Henry gets a hold of him because he's a mammoth of a man he's huge and Henry whispers something that haunts every reader of the secret history because we don't know what it is and we want to know what it is but he whispers something to Camilla and then when they all think he's going to kill Charles there's a knock on the door of the hotel and he offs himself <laughs> and it's not pretty the four of them of course grow apart once Henry is dead their Augustus their god is dead so after years have passed Richard is a professor of some kind of literature like medieval I believe and Camilla is stuck at home which was something that she did not want and it's a, quite a sad ending for Camilla I mean you did kill two people so I guess, I guess you kind of deserve it but she's stuck at home taking care of her grandmother Charles is just off and drinking across the US um, Francis attempts to off himself several times uh, not a good life not a good life I don't even know where to begin with the character relationships so let's go into the whiteboard here's the graphic beautiful isn't it listen this pen ran out of ink and I just bought it so we're going to excuse that little friend that is missed there but let's dive in because this is fun as hell let me just put my blanket on I think my cat wants to be on the blanket as well you want to come out baby because it's cold in this winter and it's the perfect vibe for the secret history anyways so let's start with our Augustus our beautiful boy our king if you will come here I know you want to come up, I know, I know, I know, there you are. Okay, so, Henry, he's in love with Camilla, Camilla is in love with him. With Richard, I mean, Richard thinks of him as a friend, Henry is like, meh, towards Richard, <laughs> he's like, okay, he's there, he's kind of psychopathic like me, so, okay, two psychopaths. Then Richard, his friends with Charles and Charles is friends with Richard she's purring Mwah, I love you so much okay then Charles Charles is friends with benefits with Francis and Francis is in love with Charles very much in love with him push and pull 
this, Charles is very much push and pull. Then we have a hate, mutual hate relationship between Henry and Charles. We have an incestuous relationship, very abusive as well, between the twins, Camilla and Charles. Camilla says, sees Richard as a friend. Richard sees Camilla with a fetishization that is so awful to behold. I just want to squeeze his neck whenever I'm reading him. And finally, Francis has a crush and is then the friend of Richard. And Richard is a friend of Francis. But can, can Richard really be a friend of anyone? That's a main question. Then we have Julian. Julian is their god. Julian is their Zeus. Anything that Julian says, they eat it up. He's a father figure, very much so, especially to Henry. Now, this is going to be important because when they tell Julian what happened and Julian is like, oh, I got to get out of here. They're going to blame me for this somehow because you kind of did the, do have the blame, but whatever. So Henry is just heartbroken. And I think that contributed to Henry offing himself, if you know what I mean. And finally, we have a bunny, which is the main foe if we're talking about Shakespearean terms. He's a foe because one, he is outside of the group's main core. He has a girlfriend outside of it, relationship with Marianne. He is popular. He has a lot of friends. He doesn't really like care about what's happening, but he's very manipulative which tends to um, which tends to portray itself in the way that he asks for money in Henry, Charles, Francis, and Richard, which is just hilarious because Richard is dirt poor. <laughs> but Bunny is also a rich dude that is actually poor. Um, my cat is biting my feet. Okay, Tarantino. He's rich, supposedly, but he's actually poor. And that's one of the things that I think contributed to him being killed. Because both Bunny and the farmer are the two kills. And what does that mean? Two people with low status in the hierarchy, which is Julian Henry, uh, Francis, the twins, Bunny, Richard, are killed. Richard is saved because he lies through his teeth and says he comes from this Hollywood family. He's saved by status because they think, the core group thinks that the hierarchy actually is Henry, Francis, the twins, Richard and Bunny at the end in terms of money. So the two people that are killed end up being the two poor people. And that's very interesting. Very, very interesting. So like I said, the book has this secret message. Not so secret, but when you really think about it, there is this class struggle message going on about how the rich get richer and they're immune to consequences and the poor end up dead. Or, in Richard's case, if you lie through your teeth and pretend that you're actually rich, well, then maybe you can have a stable life, but everyone around you just is corrupted from the inside out. And that's what happens with Francis and the twins once Henry is dead, they have no life purpose anymore without their leader. Henry is our king. He is our Augustus. He is a Roman man pretending to be a Greek. He's the richest of them all, the prodigal son, though he is so dumb when it comes to real world knowledge. Again, the moon landing, sir. How do you not know that? He presents himself as extremely self-assured, intelligent. He is a learner of everything. Though he did not take his SATs because he doesn't, doesn't believe in SATs, 
Again, sir, you are not above everyone else, but apparently he is because he's in college. Um, <clears throat> I wish that was how things worked. Uh, he's very good at what he loves to do, which is languages. So you see him a lot in Richard's POV, going over Greek, Latin. Um, they mentioned that he <laughs> translated uh, religious books. He's just a really good and intelligent and has a good head for languages. But he's dumb as hell when it comes to being your own person and knowing when and how to stop and knowing what's right and wrong. He doesn't know how to separate the two because he was spoiled from birth. He was sick when he was young. So again, spoiled as hell. And to make it all better, everyone just coddles him. No one ever says no to Henry. So Henry doesn't really know what real life consequences are. Henry doesn't seem to live in the modern era. He is instead in this very fictitious world created in his head and historical world as well. I mean, again, he is insanely obsessed with the Romans and the Greeks. I see him so much as a Roman man pretending to be a Greek man. Like, you know, the saying that the Romans took everything from the Greeks and just perfected it. That's Henry to a T. He's a Roman man that really loves what the Greeks did and just wants to be Greek himself, but is a Latin man instead, so he can't really do that. He sees himself instead as a part of a Greek drama, Roman in a Greek drama, which is why he's so intent on having a bacchanal. Henry admits to Richard that before the bacchanal, he felt he lived in a world of books, um, so he was stuck inside in his own head a lot. And Bunny tells us that as well, that Henry, because of his injury, was never really quite popular. He's very cold and aloof as is. He doesn't appreciate the other people around him like a normal person would. He doesn't really converse, converse with people. He doesn't party. He just, the, the way he meet, the way Richard tells us that they met is precisely the way that Henry is. He's very, you know, he's, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't really trust outsiders. He doesn't care for outsiders. He doesn't even see outsiders. He knows his people and there is no one else. So to be inside of Henry Winter's head and really know him, you have to be someone meaningful, someone interesting, someone that is intelligent, that cares for the same things that he does. And Richard molds himself to be that for Henry because he admires Henry a lot. Because of this, Henry and the Bacchanal is precisely what he tells us to be. He's so obsessed with books and the ancient myths and what the ancients did that he performed the Bacchanal and tried it multiple times until he deems that he actually had one and saw Dionysus. Um, Richard suspects that this motive was why Henry ended up killing the farmer and himself because he was trying to embody the duty and sacrifice so revered by Greeks. Like when you do wrong, you off yourself. Though to me, he appears much more Roman than a Greek, like I said. His trip to Rome with Bunny was the catalyst of it all. As, I mean, as a true Roman in your city, in your place, he is just completely bamboozled by Bunny being an annoying American in a foreign country and just wasting and wasting and wasting Henry's money. And he gets one of the headaches and Bunny finds out about everything because he's pretentious and writes in his diary in Latin. <laughs> it's just hilarious, by the way. But he realized, I think, in Italy, just how cold he has to be in the future. I mean, Italy for Henry was the click in, okay, I'm in 
wrong. I'm where great people that I've read about used to be. I need to be like them. So in order to be like them, I need to let go of modern morals and act like a stoic, like a Roman man would. This mother effer is annoying me, so I will have to do something about it. This is how he became so devilishly cold and murderous in regards to Bunny. Now Francis, Francis is our prince. So we have the king, then we have the prince. He is just a little happy boy at the beginning of the book with a lot of problems in his family though. But he's just described by Richard as being very flamboyant. He's not openly gay, but we know that he's gay, you know. Bunny was an a-hole again to Francis because of that. He had a relationship, sort of, with Charles. He tried to have a relationship with Richard. Maybe with Henry as well, who knows. But Henry gives me such hetero, 100% hetero vibes that I don't think even Francis would go for that. Um, they spend most, he, he's very, as Henry is an ancient Roman and Greek man, to me, Francis reads very much like a Victorian boy. Like the dramatics of it all, the sleeves, the shirts. He's very much Victorian in a way. So they spend most of their time in Francis' country house, a grandiose house with acres and acres attached to it where they perform their bacchanal and run amok doing God knows what. I wish I had such a place in my 20-something year old that I am now to just go about and rest and study Latin and read my sources, Greek and Latin sources. But unfortunately, I do not have rich friends. I don't have much friends at all. Hmm, sad. <laughs> I do have lovely Lee, and we both go to the library and talk about this. We have the twins, Camilla and Charles. They're Southern charm and money, baby. They have money, but not as much money as the East Coast babies. Though they had a secret of their own, their incestuous relationship. They like to tumble around in bed together. Charles is very abusive towards Camilla from what Richard tells us. We don't know Camilla's part in that, but yeah, she was very much abused by her brother. Though the incestuous tumbling around the bed, I believe, was consensual. It's, it's, so, we have the Roman pretending to be a Greek, we have a Victorian boy, and now we have a biblical sort of tale in the twins. There's a lot of mixture of themes and character arcs in this book. Because Charles, like for example the story of Abel and Cain, he becomes rageful, vindictive, he wants to kill, he, he just monster of a being and Camilla is pure and sweet and godlike in Richard's perspective and just a sweet little girl with nothing but pure in her heart nothing but sweetness she's just a candy to taste <sighs> I'm very saddened with Camilla's character because see oh, Richard sexualizes women so much in the book, Judy, um, his girlfriends, but Camilla, he is weird about Camilla, like really weird about Camilla. It's a fetish he has for her. It's like, oh, her skin is so white. I want to touch her, but I'm afraid I'll hurt her. And then when she hurts her foot, she, he's just like, oh. and then Henry obviously goes to take care of his girl. And he's like, whoa. Whoa, like, ah, I can't. She really is a deer being hunted by the boys, which 
we'll talk about in the back canal. She sexualized the entire book. And this also depicts what happens in academia, especially in the, human especially in the humanities departments in academia. The woman, not, not this one, Camilla. Camilla is always like seen as lesser than the man. Like when Richard says, oh, in a group of boys, she was never like, never felt herself be lesser than blah, blah. Well, she did because, I mean, she's the only girl, first and foremost. They all sexualize her to a point, and they all see her as, oh, Camilla, <laughs> she's studying. How does we hurt? <laughs> Women studying. How, how could they? <laughs> Bunny, I want to live Richard to the end. Bunny, if you look at him out of Richard's account, he's a beloved guy on campus. But Richard tells us he is an awful human being. Like he doesn't pay for expensive dinners that he takes people. <laughs> I love that scene so much. It's horrendous. The audacity to go to dinner and then go ah. Oh! forgot my wallet and that being his stick is just pure comedy pure comedy and he again was so taken by Richard's lies or maybe he was just trying to see if Richard was lying uh, about his new money kind of feel because they're all old money and Richard was pretending to be new money so Bunny was like mm, let me catch him in the lie so I don't know if he, if he was being smart about it but Bunny is very sexist, he's homophobic, he's racist, he's an a-hole to his friends, he's manipulative, he's all of that, he's not a good dude, no one is a good person in this book. But he does have outside relationships, again with Marianne, his girlfriend, which we just gloss by when he died just gloss by her grief and what happened like what and cloak i don't i didn't write cloak here but cloak and they try to blame cloak on bunny's death which is just not what weird the people closest to him bunny's loud personality gluttony and offensive beliefs become extremely grating Hailing from a family of old money in Connecticut, which actually has no money at all but their name, um, Bunny has the institutional knowledge of wealth and confidence to act as if he is as privileged as Henry, because Henry is the richest of them all. He comes from like a tycoon family of sorts. Um, while he's not self-conscious about it, he does realize that he has to play that game in order to be a, amongst the upper class. While not an exceptionally bright student because he, I believe, has um, dyslexia, that doesn't make him an exceptionally not bright student. I think that's just Richard's stupid way of looking at Bunny because I think Bunny is really intelligent. He knows how to play the game very well, but much better than Richard does. But Richard is adept at reading people and digging into their deepest insecurities. Now, finally, Richard is our narrator and he's a, oh, he's a damn liar. If I showed you every single page of my secret history annotated book, the amount of red ink on that book of me just going, he's lying here, he's also lying here, lying here, lying here, lying here. Having grown up in California in a lower middle class family, Richard has a romantic view of the ancient and elegant of the end of the East Coast families as well. I mean, wealth comes from the East Coast. It's old, old money. And having to study such a uh, profoundly humanities driven course i mean a course that only has six students 
that is extremely old money of a thing to do he is extremely snobby and hypocritical he has a disdain for anyone with with a similar background to him i mean the way he treats judy povey is insane to me like she was just trying to be nice and she was the coolest girl in canvas you were just a dork okay my god though he took ancient greek only out of convenience at his college in california he becomes determined to join Julian's class because he's a snob and he wants to be like the other snobs in the board. So even after Richard is accepted into the group, he can still never truly be himself around them. He's still lying. He's constantly lying in order to be accepted. He acts as though he's just as wealthy as the rest of them, especially as Henry, which, dude, <coughs> you wish. Uh, for fear of not being accepted because he says he sees very much what happens when one of them money That does not have the same money as the other in the group He's the way he is treated by the others in the group because he doesn't have the same kind of money He sees that he doesn't want that so he pretends to be rich in a way and have family problems in order to spend winter break back in Hampton College and not go to California which is should obviously have flagged to the others that oh this dude is just lying to us but he is the epitome of a dude looking inside a window into this friend group he idolizes them to a degree of psychopathy and insanity that makes him like so weird and like a stalker in a way because it, he didn't give up until he was a part of their group which dude okay weirdo he is kind of a chameleon he transformed himself in order to be liked by the group so it's hilarious to me that like when it all fell apart he was just in back in California being like mm, now what I killed a person now what do I do it's boring not killing people hmm. he's just there looking at the rich wanting to be rich but never being rich Let's go into the back and all. The back and all begins to take place over Richard's head after Julian gives the class an idea. Henry becomes obsessed with it. So through pages 42 to 45, this is when Julian gives the core group the idea of a back and all. We have in page 42, Richard saying to us, the reader, I thought of the Baquet, a play whose violence and savagery made me uneasy, as did the sadism of his bloodthirsty god. Compared to the other tragedies, which were dominated by recognizable principles of justice, no matter how harsh, it was a triumph of barbarism over reason, dark, chaotic, inexplicable. This is just an indication of what the entire book is. Julian then goes on to say, and it's a temptation for any intelligent person, and especially for perfectionists, such as the ancients and ourselves, to try to murder the primitive, emotive, epitative self. But that is a mistake. I don't think Richard listened to this last phrase, but that is a mistake because when Francis asks why and Julian goes on to explain everything that is wrong with it, like for example of the Romans, he goes on to say that the emperors think for example of Tiberius, the ugly stepson, trying to live up to the command of his stepfather Augustus, think of the tremendous impossible strain he must have uh, undergone following the footsteps 
of a savior, a god. The people hated him. No matter how hard he tried, he was never good enough, could never be rid of the hateful self, and finally the floodgates broke. He was set, swept away on his perversions, and he died old and mad, lost in the pleasure gardens of Capri, not even happy there, as one might hope, but miserable. And he goes on to say that um, Tiberius, before he died, wrote a letter to the Senate saying that may all the gods and goddesses visit me with more utter destruction than I feel I am daily suffering. That is so dramatic, Tiberius. Jesus Christ, dude. You won the battle of being the next emperor. Just try and be more happy about it. Jesus. Then he goes on to say, Julian goes on to say, think of those who came after him, Caligula and Nero. The whole dynasty of, Julian, of the Julian Claudians, they are all very dramatic men and they all love to be theatrical about their wails and woes and everything in between. Um, starting from Julius Caesar ending to Nero, my God, the blood that ran in that family was dramatic as hell. He then paused. The Roman genius, and perhaps the Roman flaw, he said, was an obsession with order. One sees it in their architecture, their literature, their laws. This fierce denial of darkness, unreason, chaos. He laughed. Easy to see why the Romans, usually so tolerant of foreign religions, persecuted the Christians mercilessly. How absurd to think a common criminal had risen from the dead. How appalling that his followers celebrated him by drinking his blood. The logic of it frightened them and they did everything they could to crush it. In fact, I think the reason they took such drastic steps was because they were not only frightened, but also terribly attracted to him. I mean, drinking blood out of the body of a god, come on. Pragma pragmatists are often strangely superstitious. For all the logic, who lived in more abject terror of the supernatural than the Romans? The Greeks were different. They had a passion for order and symmetry, much like the Romans, but they knew how foolish it was to deny the unseen world, the old gods. Emotion, darkness, barbarism. He looked at the ceiling for a moment, his face almost troubled. Mm. Do you remember what we were speaking of earlier, of how bloody, terrible things are sometimes the most beautiful? He said, it's a very Greek idea and a very profound one. Beauty is terror. Whatever we call beautiful, we quiver before it. And what could be more terrifying and beautiful to souls like the Greeks or our own, than to lose control completely. To throw off the chains of being for an instant, to shatter the accident of our mortal selves. Euripides speaks of the menads. Head thrown back, throat through the stars, more like deer than human being. To be absolutely free, one is quite capable, of course, of working out these destructive passions in more vulgar and less efficient ways. But how glorious to release them in a single burst, to sing, to scream, to dance barefoot in the woods in the dead of night with no more awareness of mortality than an animal. These are powerful mysteries. The bellowing of bulls. Springs of honey bubbling from the ground. If we are strong enough in our souls, we can rip away the veil and look that naked, terrible beauty right in the face. Let God consume us, devour us, and string our bones, then spit us out, reborn. We were all leaning forward, motionless. My mouth had fallen open. I was aware of every breath I took. And that, to me, is a terrible seduction of the Dionysic, that's a terrible word to read, my god, Dionysiac, Dionysic, of Dionysus, the Bacchanal, okay? God damn it, hard for us to imagine that fire of pure being. You can see this page. 
I annotated it a bunch. But this is the start of the back and all. Julian is as much at fault here for the back and all as the rest of them. He gave them the idea. And remember every single word that I read because we're gonna see them being repeated. Julian gave a bunch of 20 year olds that are already Julian gave a bunch of 20 Julian gave a bunch of 20 year olds that are already spoiled and isolated from the outside world that live inside books in ancient myths and the glory of the past that want something great that want to be something else that want to achieve something that no one else on earth is achieving right now he gave them the present he said go have a ritual for dionysus if you want this is like the best thing ever he gave them the idea let's not go against that julian their father figure gave them the idea for this ritual they were stupid enough to do it the idea came to the leader of the group of course on page 182 i passed it whoops on page 182 henry as he's confessing to richard everything that has transpired he says well as far as i knew it it hadn't been done for two thousand years he paused when he saw he hadn't convinced me after all the appeal to stop being yourself even for a little while is very great, he said, to escape the cognitive mode of experience, to transcend the accident of one's moment of being. There are other advantages more difficult to speak of, things which ancient sources only hint at, and which I myself only understood after the fact. Like what? Well, it's not called a mystery for nothing, Henry said Henry sourly. Take my word for it, but one mustn't underestimate the primal appeal to lose oneself, lose it utterly, and in losing it be born to the principle of continuous life outside the prison of mortality and time. That was attractive to me from the first, even when I knew nothing about the topic and approached it less as a potential, as a potential mystic than anthropologist. Let's dive in into what they tried to make of a bacchanal and how they supposedly succeeded. Here are the methods the gang, Henry Francis, the twins, and Bunny tried to have a bacchanal. Hymns, sacred objects, wearing chitons, drinking wine, vigils, fasting, libations, chewed laurel leaves that Richard found in the kitchen and cleansing their bodies with water. What worked? What worked was water poured over their heads, three days of fasting, Henry then has a prophetic dream, and finally they had to really believe that they would be able to um, they would be able to do such a ritual. But the actual Bacchanal that the secret history gang thinks happened um, was filled with torches, dizziness, singing, wolves howling, a bull bellowing in the dark, familiar, the river ran white, a film in fast motion, the moon waxing and waning, the clouds rushing across the sky, this is a passage of time, Vines growing around them, like in the trees, like snakes, again familiar. The boys hunt a deer in the form of Camilla, again familiar. And of course, the sex ritual, and of course, the sex rituals, as ritual so ghastly points out. Finally, they saw Dionysus, but they call it a bacchanal, the Roman term, instead of bacche, the Greek. So they go for the god Bacchus the goddess of wine for the Romans, 
but they say that they saw Dionysus, the Greek one. A little weird, we'll get into it. And then they end up killing someone, a farmer of a lower class individual who did them no harm. The disposal of the body, the sheer brutality of their crime, it's horrendous. Now, this was the secret history in their background. Shall we look at real history now then? The story of Pentheus and Bacchus comes out of the Greek myth and is situated in a Greek milieu of Dionysus Bacchus symbolized the apolitical dimension of human existence as it manifests in Euripides tragedy the Black A, like we talked about in the book, like Richard thought about in the book, and then Julian mentioned it to get them <laughs> excited about doing such a ritual. So how did the Bacchanalia make its way to Rome? Livy claims that an unknown Greek came first to Etruria, who was a priest of nocturnal rites of secrets, and that later the rites were transformed by a priestess in Campania. There is archaeological evidence of Dionysus in Etruria and Campania, and he had been established in Polis, a cult in Magna Graecia, since the, step, since the 6th century BC. Now, Frank suggests that the cult was brought to Rome by Greek slaves from Tarantium and Locri, who had been captured during the Second Punic War, but um, Toynbe widens the suggestion by describing a massive demographic shift of slaves and refugees alike. So basically the god and the rituals of the Bacchae of Dionysus transformed itself into Bacchus and the Bacchanalia in Rome because of a large social gathering of people that believed in such rituals and in, in, in such a god. They both argue that the Bacchanalia came to Rome by Greek migrations, so not by Romans. The Bacchanalia came to Rome, the center of the empire, because of all of these things. It was inevitable with the city's growing importance. Here, Livy's account stands up to reason. Magna Gracia, Campania, and Etruria, having been in Rome's sphere of influence over a century, of course, the sixth century, um, and then very much long before what happened in 186 BCE. Dionysus had been called Liber in Rome since 496 BC and was honored in traditional Roman cults, but had long since been Romanized by the Senate and the Pontifical, Pontific, yeah, the Pontif, and then, and then, and then, <coughs> Dionysus had been called Liber. Dionysus had been called Liber in Rome since 496 BCE, and the Romans and the Roman cults they Romanized the god Dionysus into Liber by the Senate and the Pontifical College. The difference between Liber and the Bacchanalia was that the Bacchanalia were ecstatic mystery rites. But even more ecstatic was Magna Mater, the big mother, Caebile, and she was welcomed by the Senate with the highest honors in 204 BC, so 200 years later, almost 300 years later. At the advice of the Sibylline oracles, Rome and <coughs> at the advice of the Sibylline oracles, Rome sent Scipio <coughs> At the, advice, <clears throat> at the advice of the Sibylline oracle, Rome sent Scipio Nasica to bring Caebile to Pergamum. When she arrived, she was greeted by a great celebration and taken to the Palatine, where her temple was completed in 191 BC. The orgiastic rites of the castrated cross-dressing galley certainly did not appeal to the conservative Roman taste. Romans are much more conservative than their Greek counterparts. 
but the cult of Caebelia was restricted and supervised by Roman magistrates. Only one priest and one priestess and one annual procession were allowed, when other gods had many more rites throughout the year, throughout the calendar. While Roman citizens were forbidden from its priesthoods and practices, and the wildest rites were banned entirely. Liber was a traditional cult, and Magna Mater was a mystery cult. But here is the point. Both were state-regulated. So when Liber became Bacchus or Dionysus, Dionysus had been the most famous god in the ancient times. I mean, he was inescapable. He was so popular because he was the god of theater, of wine, which contrary to the ancient assertion that it had nothing to do with Dionysus, he was permeated in, Bacchic, in the Bacchic themes. By 186 BC, the theater had appeared in Rome and the earliest Latin literature includes playwrights from this period, including Ennius, Nevius, and Plautus. Plautus is important because his comedies are some of the first Roman literature sources that mention Bacchus, the god Bacchus, the Roman version of Liber and Dionysus. And the nearest source to the events that occurred in 186 BC. He catered to the Bacchic references that appear and are, cl and are clearly pejorative. In Rudens, the slave Thracalio asks a group of fishermen if they had seen the scoundrel who had cheated his master and described him as a Bacchus type, hateful to gods and men, vicious and evil. Bularia, a cook named Il, after being put to work, runs out to the kitchen crying, Debutants of Dionysus, me and my boys have been taking some Bacchic beating. Plausus leans two classic Roman puns in Bacchires, a comedy about two sisters both named Bacchis. Bacchis, the first lover, Pistocleros, senses that the sisters are manipulating him and declares, I'm afraid of you, Bacantes, and your Bacchanals, Bacchis. Later in the play, Pistocleros' slave Leidos comes out of the Bacchides' house, shocked at their immoral behavior, and tells the audience that the these sisters' Bacchis are Bacchises, they're Bacchae. In Roman comedy, Bacchic was a colloquial insult, denoting violent frenzies and sexual deviance by low-status, immoral people. To call someone Bacchic was to describe him or her as the worst kind of human being. You can see why they chose to go with Dionysus in the secret book, right? But hidden in the message of them calling it a bacchanal was that they were the worst kind of human beings. So in mid-Republican Rome, there was kind of an experience being had that was quite similar to Ovid's Thebes. Ovid is a part of the Augustan period, however, but the experience is much similar. The arrival of a cult of Bacchus, which merged with Italy's cult of Liber, most likely sometime towards the end of 3rd century BCE. Um, not much is known about the actual Bacchanalia, like Henry said, but as with all mystery religions, the wings of the worshippers have remained mysterious. But it is clear that after an initial period of toleration, and this happens with everything, you tolerate first, you let it be, and then the government's like, no, you don't get that anymore. So after that, the Roman Senate concluded that certain boundaries of law and order were being breached by cult members and issued a decree against the Bacchic associations responsible for organizing the worship. To begin with, it is clear that the senatorial intervention was not directed against Bacchus as a foreign divinity. I mean, the Romans were famous for having foreign divinities in their space. Isis was a beloved goddess and she's not of the Greek realm or the Roman realm. She's from Mesopotamia. She's loved in Rome. Rather, the Senate seems to have been acting in particular against the behavior of cult members in relation to each other and not in relation to the god. 
Rom wished, therefore, to preclude the possibility that cults could serve as vehicles for achieving local solidarity. The prohibitions of the decree suggest that the target was less the religious practices as such than the possibility of political fraternization because so many people fraternizing in a cult, so many important people fraternizing in a cult is dangerous for the state because they share ideas, they have something in common, alliances are built. Indeed, the decree makes no effort to ban the worship of Bacchus entirely, only to specify the conditions of worship. What Roman officials seem to have feared was the possibility that, unless brought under senatorial control, the cult might serve as a vehicle for anti-Roman politics and the migrants, the Greek migrants, might take over Rome. There's always that fear with the Romans that their enemies, that the people they conquer, will rise up against them. Arguably, the shift from Euripides' emphasis on illicit sex on Ovid's focus on power politics that is mirrored in the way their respective figures of Penthos react to the arrival of Bacchus reflects this concern. <laughs> The account of the historian Levy is offering the modern reader a vivid and salacious account of what happened in which sex, intrigue and xenophobia register insistently. It is in fact a chronicle of the affair shot through with a bunch of Augustan moral legislation and moral views. So he's, Levy, Levy is writing in the time of Augustus so let's say 20 BC, um, 20, yeah, let's say 20 BC, 20 to 15 BC. We don't, we don't actually know when he was writing. Augustus was actively pursuing people that were against the Roman morals and mores maiorum. And so Livy is looking back in history as he is writing history with that thought in his mind, if, it, if that makes sense. It's a, a very big mistake for an historian to do, but that's how historians of the time did things. So I, I, had, I can't criticize Livy in that amount. The idiom in which Livy describes what the Bacchus cult members practice is parallel with Pantheos' characterizations of Bacchants and their rights in Ovid's account. The theme of sexual license registers with particular emphasis. When wine had inflamed their minds, and night and the mingling of males with females and young with old had destroyed all sense of modesty, every variety of debauchery began to be practiced, since each one had to hand the form of pleasure to which his nature was most inclined. The denigration continues with accusations of trickery and fraud in terms of Pentheos and the imputation of magicae fraudes, um, magical frauds, political conspiracy, and even, and even ritual murder, followed by the sacrilegious disposal of the victim's bodies. <clears throat> Reminding you of anyone? Levi's rhetoric against this evil finds an analogy in Pentheus' outrage against the Bacchus and his followers in Ovid. Both conceive of the cult's propagation in terms of territorial encroachment, though Pentheus' metaphor of choice is military conquest, whereas Levi is a spreading pestilence. It's just annoying, you know, to the people of Rome. It's the destructive factor, the destructive force of this wickedness spread from Etruria to Rome like a contagion. It's a virus to Levi. Roman society or societal groups or any society for that matter, selects only a very limited number of concepts as, constitu as constituent of its value system and embodying societal reason. Those that do not meet the criteria for the Roman way of being are completely outside of it. They are pushed away. Again, do we remember what I said about the class struggles? Yeah. Yeah. Who is pushed away? Who is constantly feeling out of place? Richard. 
Bunny tries his best to not be pushed away and ends up being pushed away and out of a goddamn ravine. So, mm, very literal in that sense. For instance, according to conventional Roman selection, it was unreasonable for women to vote, to be invested with political power, or to go to war. Camilla, everyone, this does not mean that the Romans could not theoretically conceive of the position of women in these ways. Again, Camilla, anyone? She's there, she can do those things, but they don't want her to. They find it sweet and heart, so heartwarming that she is making an effort to do those things. The position of women in these ways, um, societal pressure would prevent such a choice of alternative concepts from being put into practice. Roman religion was not independent of society. Religion exists because of society. John Shade has aptly remarked, there was in fact no such thing as Roman religion, only a series of Roman religions, as many Roman religions as there, as there were social groups. A warning not to generalize is provided by the Bacchic movement of 186 BC. Its leaders and followers may have been aristocrats or at least belonged to the socially privileged, hence why the Roman Senate was so afraid of them communing with each other, of them forming alliances in a cult that wasn't Roman per se, that wasn't allowed, that was so pure and liberating in a way, so Greek. So the actual participation of the higher strata of the Roman society would well explain the extraordinary attention that the Bacchic rituals took um, and were paid for by the Senate in the Bacchanalia affair. 186 BCE, the Roman Senate decided to take measures against the worshippers of the god Bacchus and thereby initiated one of the largest systematic persecutions of religious groups hitherto seen in Europe. And according to Levy, 7,000 people fell victim to the campaign. We can't compare it to the millions of, of course, the Nazis and what happened with the Armenians as well. But 7,000 in, in that time is a lot of people, especially wealthy people at that. They fell victim to the campaign and the majority of them were executed. They died because they were part of the Bacchus cult. Levy also reports that the measures caused great terror inside and outside of the city, numerous suicides and a mass flight from Rome. According to Cicero, not a friend of the channel, the measures even included military operations, which make them appear almost crusade-like. The measures against the Bacchic cult lasted five years altogether. In the end, the cult was not completely eliminated, but reduced to a manageable size and subjected to strict regulations. For, for the first time, the Roman Senate had massively interfered with the religious affairs of the Foderati. Now, this is quite significant. In Livy's narrative, Publius Evutius was a young member of an equestrian family. After the death of his father, he was brought up under the protection of his stepfather, who embezzled the property of his ward. In order not to be held accountable by the judicial authorities, the stepfather and the mother of Pluvius sought to destroy the virtue and reputation of the young man by urging him to become an initiate to the Bacchanalia. However, a well-known prostitute, the freedwoman Hispalia Vexenia, who had a love affair with the young Publius, warned him about the cult. As a girl, she had been initiated to the Bacchanalia together with her mistress and had observed the horrible rites practiced in the cult. Upon her urgent advice, Publius refused initiation into the mysteries of the Bacchanalia and consequently was expelled from the house of his stepfather. Publius consulted the council's Spurius Postumus 
Albinus, who then decided to investigate the case. The outcome of the inquiry was the following. The Bacchus cult, deriving from the Greek Dionysian festivals, had first come to Etruria and from there to Rome, where the rites were performed in the Grove of Stimula. In the beginning, it seems to have caused no major misgivings. His folly reports to the Council Posthumus at the Bacchanalia had started as a cult for women and it was a rule that no man should be admitted. There have been three fixed days in the year on which initiations took place, at daytime into the Bacchic mysteries, and it was the custom for the matrons to be chosen as priestesses in rotations. Now, the trouble began when the woman named Pacula Anya became priestess and altered the rites. According to Levy, the Bacchanalia eventually turned into violent sex orgies, including the rape of female and male adolescents. The historian lets Espada go on with a report. Pacula Anya had performed the ceremonies by night instead of by day, and in place of three days in a year, she had appointed five days of initiation in each month. From the time when the rites were held promiscuously with men and women mixed together, and when the license offered by darkness had been added, no sort of crime, no kind of immorality was left unattempted. There were more obscenities practiced between men than between men and women. Anyone refusing to submit to outrage or reluctant to commit crimes was slaughtered as a sacrificial victim. To regard nothing as forbidden was among these people the summit of religious achievement. Levy also, Levy also tells us that Posthumus, when he presented the conclusions of his investigation to the senators, the two reasons that were seized with extreme panic, pavor ingens, and collectively afraid of the account of the community of publico nomine, that these conspiracies and nocturnal meetings could and might lead to some secret treachery or hidden peril. And privately, privatim, each one feared on his own behalf, afraid that it might have some connection with this horrid business. The Senate reacted quickly. Postimius and his co-consul Quintus Marcus Philippus were officially empowered to conduct an extraordinary inquiry, a questio extra ordinem. The Senate decreed that the priests of these rites, male and female, were sought out, not only in Rome, but in all market towns and centers of population, so that they should be available for the councils. Furthermore, that it should be proclaimed in the city of Rome, and edicts should be sent out throughout Italy to the same effect, that no one, that no one who had been initiated into the Bacchic rites should attempt to assemble or for the purpose of holding these ceremonies or to perform any such religious rites. More especially, it was decreed that an inquiry should be held regarding those persons who had assembled or conspired for the furtherance of any immoral or criminal design. Livia describes immediately following the persecutions which were enacted as questio extraordinaria on the basis that a decree was necessary in these emergency measures, that it was so grave that they had to do something about it now. And this reminds us of the Christian um, persecution by the Romans as well, and the FBI coming in so quickly to investigate what happened with Bunny's death. The great number of victims and the rashness with which the Roman authorities reacted seemed to explain the great terror, terror magnus, that came over Rome and Italy. However, after these immediate steps, the Senate issued another most carefully, another more carefully composed decree, which was supposed to regulate the future worship of the god Bacchus in Rome, Italy, and the Empire. Levy summarizes it as Levy summarizes it as follows. For the future, it was provided by decree of the Senate that there should be no Bacchanalia in Rome or in Italy. If any person regarded such ceremonies as hallowed by tradition and as essential for him 
and believed himself unable to forego them without being guilty of sin, he was to make a declaration before the city praetor, and the praetor would consult the senate. If permission was granted to the applicant, at a meeting attended by at least a hundred members of the senate, he would be allowed to perform the rites, provided that no more than five people took part. And there was to be no common fund of money, no president of ceremonies, and no priest. This seems very Illuminati, like like the president of ceremonies, you know? I wonder if this is where people got the idea for the Illuminati imagery. Anyways, <clears throat> the text of this second decree is preserved on a bronze tablet that's found that was found in the 17th century in a museum that I cannot pronounce because it is in Vienna and I don't know Dutch. And I think it's Dutch the language. The original text of the decree does not differ much from the contents of the decree of the historian Levy. So Levy was actually not lying to us. In addition, archeology span um, Evidence shows that exactly at the same time, temples dedicated to Bacchus were violently destroyed. So that sucks because we don't have anything to see in relation to what was this mystery cult. Another somewhat neglected source is Cicero, which again is not a friend of the channel and I will hate him forever. He constructs the ideal religious laws in the second book of the Legibus of laws, blah, blah, blah. The fact that Cicero incorporates the senatorial decree in his construct shows that it was real, that Levy wasn't lying, again, there is archaeological proof, and that it was a huge thing in Rome. Levy's narrative concludes with the significant rewards given to the heroes of the story. Aebutius and Hispalia, the woman that came forward and spoke about it, for their efforts to protect the city against great harm. The Bacchanalia have to be seen as domestic and secret conspiracies. This argument implies that the Bacchanalia are first and foremost a political problem which requires social constraint. It's a political problem that needs a political solution. So Postumius' speech, the guy that was supposed to be initiated into the Bacchanalia, but the freed woman that was once a prostitute said, yo, don't do that, it's really weird, don't, please don't do that. Well, he said, the Bacchanalia are no longer just a problem of private religion, even though it is yet confined to private outrages, private noxia. Ultimately, the impious conspiracy of the Bacchans aimed at taking over the complete control of the Republic. Therefore, the Republic must act. Yet, the Council has to fight the popular fear that measures against the cult will raise the anger of the gods. Previous interpreters of this text have overlooked that in the course of his argumentation. Posthumus, or respectively Levy redefined the concept of superstition, that it wasn't all that bad. It is no longer described by Cicero just an unjustified fear of the gods, but a fear of gender, of misjudgment, of people of higher strata managing to go over the original channels, official channels, and overtaking Rome, as nothing is more deceptive in its appearance than a depraved religion. When the agency of the gods is made an excuse for criminal acts, there comes into the mind the fear that in punishing human misconduct, we may be doing violence to something of divine sanction that is mixed up with offenses. But you are freed from such religion by countless decisions of the pontiffs, resolutions of the senate, and, for good measure, responses of the soothsayers. I have thought it right to give you this warning, so that no superstition may agitate your minds when you observe us suppressing the Bacchanalia and breaking up these criminal gatherings. 
Now, posthumous does not think of a completely secular sphere of political action. He adds that all measures against the Bacchanalia are favored and willed by the gods. So all the gods are against Bacchus and Dionysus in a way, even though Dionysus is the most popular and beloved god till today. Anyway, he says that basically uh, this claim presupposes that the gods grant to the humans a sphere of independent action, even including religious affairs. But the Bacchus cult is basically an alien religion in Rome. That's why it was spread like an epidemic and it's described as such. That's why Levy attacks it as such, because it was spread so quickly it was obviously fun for the people in Hagia Stratus to go out and have fun and uh, hoard, have orgies whenever they wanted. I mean, that's what these 20 something year olds did. That's what the 20 something year olds in Rome are going to do. Obviously, that's what's going to happen, especially when there's drugs and all of that involved. Posthumus gives speech concerning the Moros Maiorum of Rome, like, we have to keep that going, we cannot let ourselves be like the Greeks and fall from our grace of being the great Romans. I mean, it's just again, 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 and again, it's repeated throughout Roman history, them thinking that their morals are bigger than. I'm not even, I don't need to say anything, but he says, Levy again, for men of deepest insight in all matters of divine and human law came to the decision that nothing tended so much to the destruction of religion as a situation where sacrifices were offered, not with the traditional ritual, but with ceremonies imported from abroad. So that's the main issue. It, it's not original to the territory. It's not Roman. It's not theirs. That's they're being very xenophobic. Again, like the main core of the secret history is them getting everyone away. They're very isolated, like Rome. Rome wants to just, they have their gods. They don't want there to be a lot of mixture. Like, they allow other gods to exist. Like, the secret history allows other people to exist. They can exist, they can do whatever they want. But as soon as those people get mixed up in their weird stuff, they die. Or as soon as they try to um, put a stop to the weird stuff that they, they do or the bad, moral, corrupted things that they do, they die. And this is what happened with the Bacchanalia affair in 186. The Romans were like, this is not good for us politically. There's a lot of important people here. We don't like it. It's foreign. It's not ours. And we have to protect our mores maiorum. We have to protect our politics. We have to protect ourselves first and foremost. So they're not us. They die. Okay. That's basically what happened. I mean, the Romans were such stoics that when Livy describes what the Bacchanalia turned turns into being like he says the pleasures of drinking and fasting were added to the religious rites to attract a larger number of followers so the cult started very small and then to add more people and to i mean gain power in rome over the other cults they added things that they knew people wanted to have fun i mean a 20 something year old wants to have fun and fasting means you'll get to have all of these experiences and the three days fasting that ha also happens in the sacred history um, that is mentioned in the beginning of the tale that Levi tells us and again here he also says when wine had inflamed their feelings and night and the mingling of the sects and of different ages had extinguished all power of moral judgment all sort of corruption began to be practiced since each person had ready to hand the chance of gratifying the particular desire to which he was naturally inclined. And this is, I mean, it's very well known that everyone in the secret history sort of, you know, had an affair with each other. 
and that's what also happened with the Bacchanalia in the ancient times. These words make very clear that Livy saw the sexual excesses as the core of the Bacchanalian scandal. As Ispalia says, the feeling of absolute license, licentia, and the negation of sacrilege, nephas, were the guiding principles of the orgies. They wanted freedom, they wanted to be sacrilege, they wanted to go against the norm. So, the essence of the cult, like Livy is referring to the Stoic, Stoic doctrine of the natural instincts, is okay, the natural instinct is to be like animals and to just let our moral selves be and just do things like animals do. The adult human, however, has morals that we think in a way that shouldn't be, I mean, it's not normal for us to do such brutalic things like Henry describes. He says he felt like an animal, something else. Uh, I mean, he references the bull bellowing like Julian men mentioned it. I mean, he's just repeating what Julian said. That's why I don't believe they actually had a bacchanalia. They were just drunk and probably on acid off of their minds and just killed someone. And uh, he repeated everything that Julian said, but we'll, we'll get to that. Cicero then explains that this, po this policy, this decree, this second decree, um, lists the archetypes of what was morally good, morally bad. So he says, human manner and community custom have established that they, as regards fame and disposition, raise up to heaven persons of distinguished benefaction, thus, Hercules, Castor, and Pollux, Esculapius, Liber, i.e. Dionysus, and Romulus, the same one whom they regard as Quirinus, with their souls enduring and enjoying eternal life, are fittingly regarded as gods, since they are the very best and are immortal. Henry talking about mortality, again, it's all here, it's all in real history about what happened in the secret history. So the Bacchic cult had always offered an alternative opportunity to find some fulfillment for people who had no chance to participate in the care and for the administration of the republic and that was the fear of them that people were feeling powerful when they were not powerful in their actual real life careers and according to cicero the republican epitome of a meaningful life that's all that matters to have a career so these people were feeling that same feeling that a Roman man would feel by having a prosperous career in the magist magistrate and they were having it by just having these weird orgies, you know. Bolt ran out of control, the Senate came in, seized everything, killed 7,000 people, higher strata people, and made sure that no the Roman way is the only way, and you are not about to do this to us ever again. And I mean, it did set an example because it was so, so, so bad that there is not an example in Roman history that is similar to it. I mean, some people may have used the cult just to live out their sexual fantasies, but never, nevertheless, there is a reason to doubt that the majority of the people that were in the cult that spent their time fasting and drinking wine in order to see Dionysus or Bacchus or participate in the orgies, they were at their core wanting this unrestrained feeling. They didn't want to be in a society that didn't want them. They wanted to be something else. They wanted to be immortal. They wanted to feel like a god, you know, like an animal, like not themselves. And that's the appeal of the Bacchanalia, to not be yourself, to feel more than, to feel higher than. As even Postumius admits 
they all felt, the, the people of the cult felt that they were driven by a divine force. Henry says that as well, that he was driven by a divine force. And they claimed that they were acting according to what that divine force wanted. Again, they said that as well. So the killing of the farmer happened because he interrupted their communing with the divine force at hand, with Dionysus, with Bacchus. So the Bacchans, the people of the Bacchus cult, act apolitically from the perspective of the Republic Cosmion because Bacchus was not an a was not a part of the pantheon of the Roman gods. He was an alien god to them. So if the Republic would not defend itself against this alien element, then Bacchus and the Bacchans would establish their own cosmion, their own religion, and therefore be separate from the Romans and maybe rise up above the Romans. So their virtuous and pious citizens would be an alien element and subject to elimination. The Romans very much view people as you are with us or you are against us. So if you are against us, we must eliminate you. And they think that other people think that as well. So if these alien people that um, were part of the Bacchic cult saw themselves as, okay, we are the right ones and the Romans are the bad ones, they are the alien ones, we must eliminate them. So it was a clash of morality. The myths that say that Dionysus has to fight constantly for his acknowledgement as a proper god in the divine as well as, his, as in the human realm, it, it's, it's true in the sense of history. Um, it's very interesting that the mythological enemies of Dionysus are almost always rulers. We have Perseus of Argos, uh, Lycurgus of Thracia, Pentheus of Thebes, and we have here we have here Dionysus' main antagonist, I would say, is Julian. Because when Julian learns, and Julian says it is a mistake to do so, but in, and so when Julian learns that they actually did do a Bacchanalia, he is against it. And the ruler of the Bacchanalia, Henry, that acts for Dionysus is broken that his version of a father of a ruler his king doesn't accept it so in the Bacchae the, um, the play that we mentioned in the secret history um, Zeus announces his return the Ill illegitimate son of Zeus announces his return to Thebes, the hometown of his mother, Selene, as follows. To these overland cities first I come, having established in far lands my dances and rides to be God manifest to them. Now Cadmus gave his crown and royal estate to Pensos of another daughter born who wars with heaven in me. And from my libations thrusts nor makes mention of me in his prayers. Therefore to him, my Godhead, will I prove unto all sevens. So Bacchus, Bacchus, Dionysus, keeps having to prove himself. And we can say that for Richard, he has to prove himself constantly to the group. And he does not participate in the Bacchanal. He does participate in the killing of Bunny. Henry wants to prove himself to Julian. The twins want to prove themselves to their family and to Henry. Same for Francis, to society and to Henry. So in 186 BC, when the Roman Senate passed the Senatus Consultum de Bacchanalibus, a law that suppressed the cult of Dionysus of Bacchus in both Rome and all of Italy, well, that's the suppression of the god Dionysus again. Hence, 
the departure of Henry from his fictional world, the complete manifestation of everything that happened with the cult in Rome that was separated or just very small happened with the sacred history. Everything got very tiny, everyone separated, everyone went into their corners, there was no more Greek classes, Julian disappeared, everyone either finished college or just simply went away because there was no more purpose. Some people died, some people got into alcohol, just everything burst, the bubble burst, their isolation was no more because society is a community and they did not want an alien thing forming inside of it. Ovid offers us a very succinct description of Bacchus and Dionysus and his cult. And Ovid is a lover of all of depravity and freedom, sexual love. So let's read it. You are blessed with endless youth. You are eternally a boy, high heaven star, the handsomest of all. Your face is like a virgin's when you don't display your horns. You've won the Orient, its farthest bounds are yours, where sun scorched India is bathed by games. You, the god men venerate, killed sacrilegious Pentheos and Lycurgus, the one who plied the two wedged battle axe. It's you who seized the Tuscans, you who cast their bodies overboard, your chariot rolls heavily across the mountaintops is drawn by lynxes and it has bright reins. Bacchans and satyrs follow in your wake. Together with Silanus, that old man is drunk. He staggers, leaning on his staff, or hardly keeps his seat upon the back of the bent as he rides. And where you pass, young men and women chant and clamor, glad. Palms beat the tambourines, bronze cymbals clash, Long flutes of perforated boxwood add their strident music. Theban women cry, Be with us now, or merciful and mild, observing as the priest that asks your rights. Our sweet murderous Henry says that a bacchanal and that the god was not worshipped in over 2,000 years. And I want to clarify that that is not true because in the Renaissance and in the Middle Ages, there were still many fans of Bacchus and Dionysus. Till today, there are still many people. I read an article that in, I think, 2016, there were people celebrating Dionysus and Bacchus and the Bacchanalia in Turkey. So, Henry, you don't know your stuff. <laughs> so let's disprove what Henry said about the, oh, it hasn't been done in 2000 years because he wanted to feel special, right? So in 15th century Italy, there was this reawakening of the ancient god of wine um, in a Christian society too. We have, for example, well-known paintings from Giovanni Bellini's Feast of the Gods and Titian's Bacchus and Ariadne and Bacchanal of the Adrians, created for Alfonso d'Este's Camerino de Alabastros in Ferrara in the first quarter of the 16th century. Then we have Lorenzo de' Medici that wrote a song that exclaims happily, Viva Bacu e Viva More, as Boccaccio pref prefaced in his massive consolidation of facts about the pagan gods. The huge corpus of gods and noble princes had been torn limb from limb, bitten and reduced nearly to ashes. Even with love and sensuality as some of their primary tra traits Bacchus and his motley band of followers began to reappear in the 15th century. So again, Henry, you're not special. Uh, Bernardino de, de Siena in the 1420s to Savonarola in the 1490s. Also, we have rituals for Bacchus. I mean, I guess anytime you're drinking wine, you're kind of like going, hey, Bacchus, or hey, Dionysus, this, this one's for you. It, it's, it's the way it goes, you know? A 
alas, this was a long video. <sighs> we are almost done. We've talked about the secret history and real history and the similarities between the two where some aired, some were right, where the similarities between the Bacchanalias happened. And I hope that this video met your expectations and that you enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun researching this and diving back into the world of the sacred history. I adore Donna Tartt, I adore the book, I adore Roman history, I mean that's my field. So to see humans and humanity and the way we shift and move ourselves in this current of life be represented so brilliantly in this book remains the reason why it's one of my favorites because Anatar understood what the Romans in their essence were and Henry is a Roman wanting to be a Greek and that was his biggest mistake because he became alien to the world he was in he became alien to his Roman fellow to Julian and therefore he was no longer appreciated he was pushed back from the world that he knew that he had known for the last years we also have the twins completely disintegrating themselves Francis is a mess Bunny is dead Richard is the only one that has a semblance of a normal life but he must live forever knowing that he was not a part of something but he knows that he could have been a part of it had he been deemed high enough in this social strata and that's the story of the secret history wealth class struggles and the want for more there's this salacious wanting for more and more and more and more and more and that's what a bacchanalia is is the extravagant it's luxury it's everything mixed in so you don't feel mortal so you don't fear death so you f you only feel like the god dionysus itself you are immoral immortal you don't have morals you can do anything that you want and that's the mystery of the bacchanalia and that's the mystery of the secret history Thank you so much for watching please like and subscribe and comment if you wish to do so i will be back with another video if you have any suggestions i'll be more than happy to do them and research for you because research is a ton of work and i love to do it so bye class <laughs>